Welcome back to the AKA Catholic Podcast. I'm your host, Louis Barecchio. I want to begin today with a scripture verse. I charge thee before God in Jesus Christ, who shall judge the living and the dead by his coming and his kingdom. Preach the word, the instant, in season and out of season. Reprove, entreat, rebuke in all patience and doctrine. These words come from the second epistle of St. Paul to Timothy, and I'm sure they're very familiar to you. The instant, in season and out of season. What does that mean? It means be ready. It means do it without hesitation. That is, preach the truth even when it's not popular. St. Paul goes on to say that a time is coming when people will not endure sound doctrine. Rather, they will seek out teachers who will tell them what they want to hear. They will turn toward fables instead of the truth. In fact, they'll turn away from the truth. And he goes on to tell Timothy, Be thou vigilant, labor in all things, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill thy ministry, be sober. It occurs to me that most of us seem to focus in this scripture passage on the exhortation itself. Preach the truth, even when it's unpopular, and indeed, preach the truth, especially when it's unpopular. Reprove and rebuke the fables that people are clinging to. Reprove and rebuke those false teachers who are spreading those fables and telling the people with itching ears what they want to hear. But I think we need to pay a lot closer attention to verse number one. When St. Paul says, I charge thee before God and Jesus Christ, who shall judge the living and the dead. That should give all of us pause because this means all of us. Look, it's, it's very easy to read this exhortation and to point a finger at the priests and the bishops and say, hey, did you see that? He's urging Timothy, Timothy to carry out his ministry soberly. But this passage has more than just that immediate literal meaning. Yes, in the literal sense, St. Paul was writing an epistle to Timothy himself, instructing him directly. But there's also a spiritual sense here. The moral sense, for example, telling us how we're to behave at this moment in time when the truth is most definitely out of season. If climate change were real, that threat would pale in comparison to the fact that the entire globe is in such a spiritual state of decay that the truth is out of season just about everywhere. Just about everywhere. St. Paul is speaking to all of us in this moral sense, but there's also an anagogical sense, which means it points to the end of time. As it's said, as he said in the very opening verse, I charge thee before God and Jesus Christ, who shall judge the living and the dead. This should be a wake-up call to all of us. We're going to be judged based on how well or whether or not we spoke the truth in this season where the truth is unpopular. Did we speak it or did we keep it to ourselves? Do we have the truth in us? Do we have a certain moral certitude about what is right and what is wrong? What is true doctrine? What is false doctrine? And yet we keep it to ourselves because it's unpopular. And there's a price to pay for speaking the truth out loud at a time like this. Look, we're all real good at fooling ourselves, and I count me among those people. We're fallen. We're sinful. We make excuses for ourselves all the time. But... I'm thinking here especially of men like myself who are involved in, in Catholic media in some way or another, and we have a, an audience that's a little bit uh, larger than many other people. I think we have a grave responsibility not to keep the truths that we possess to ourselves. Why? Because it, it, you know it, we tell ourselves, well, it's prudent. It's prudent that I should hold this to myself because if I don't, well, then I'm going to lose my influence. And I'm, Whatever. <laughs> I'm not pointing fingers at anybody in particular. You can, you know, I guess I was going to say decide for yourself who this applies to and who it doesn't, but don't even go there. This is our Lord's job. If it applies to you who are hearing my voice, you'll know it. And furthermore, and more importantly, our Lord knows it. You know, we can fool ourselves and talk ourselves into believing that uh, keeping the truth to ourselves when it's unpopular to broadcast it is a prudent thing to do. But you can't fool Jesus Christ. You can't. The just judge will see you for exactly what you are, and there's going to be a price to pay. That's why St. Paul starts with that. He's essentially saying, look, you're going to be judged on this, so pay attention. Okay? So I, I offer this to you now as the backdrop 
for moving forward in this episode where I want to share with you that I had a conversation last week with a priest whose name would be fairly well known to you. He has a, a presence in Catholic media among traditional Catholics. You would recognize his name if I mentioned it. I won't, however, because it was a private conversation. But he shared with me in this conversation that he does not believe that Francis is the Pope. And he has not believed this for some time now. And perhaps even more importantly, he shared with me the fact that there's a number of his brother priests who likewise do not believe that Francis is the Pope. And yet they're keeping that truth to themselves. And he's a terrific guy. I really enjoyed this conversation that we had. It's the first time we spoke. Um, we talked on the telephone for, I guess, roughly half an hour. And I hope it's not our last conversation. And I trust it's not going to be. But but he's a very humble man, so much so that he invited me to speak with him about when it might be appropriate and prudent for him to go public with this moral certitude that he has, that Francis is not a legitimate pope, he's an antipope. Now, we'll return to that in a moment, but in the course of our conversation, Father asked me to clarify my own position on Francis, which he realizes I think that Francis is not a true pope, he's an antipope, but but why do I think that? And furthermore, what is my opinion on John the 23rd on forward? These claimants to the chair of St. Peter in this conciliar mad age of ours. And so it occurs to me, we have readers coming and going all the time at AKA Catholic. My hope is that there's more coming than going, but whatever, I'm going to speak the truth. And if that causes a mass exodus, exodus, so be it. In fact, that's the history of this blog. If you've been on board with AKA Catholic from the beginning, or even going back further than that, back when it was called Harvesting the Fruit of Vatican II during my conservative adolescence, when I was out there defending the council, we've come a long way. And the way that we've come is all glory and honor to God. It's by His grace alone. When I have moral certitude that something is true, I'm going to say it. And I'll gladly pay the price for doing so. And I've done that over the years. And yes, there is a cost to telling the truth and, and not keeping the truth to myself because things will go better for me if I do. I don't play that game, and by God's grace, I never will. In any case, I want to talk to you a little bit about my position on Francis and the men who preceded him, not because I think my opinion is so valuable, but rather uh, it could be instructive, however, the way in which I've approached this question. And the fact of the matter is this question is on pretty much every serious Catholic's mind, as far as I can tell. You know, from much of the past 10 years, and of course, going much further back, but it seems like over the past decade, especially, practically every serious Catholic, I mean, and I'm talking about Novus Ordo Catholics, conservative Catholics, people who wouldn't necessarily call themselves traditional, all the way up to people who uh, insist that they are traditionalist. All of these Catholics have a nagging sense that something is wrong. Something is terribly wrong. Now, for many of us, especially those of you who are regulars at AKA Catholic, we've had this sense for a very long time. Some people have had it for much, much longer. Going back to, you know, the early 60s, some people understood that something was terribly wrong. But one of the things that all of these people have in common is, unless you've already decided that Francis isn't the Pope, Many sincere Catholics, people who genuinely want to believe and to live inside the Catholic Church, they're wondering if Francis is truly the Pope. And so, you know, we need to try to get our hands around, how does one go about making sense of a situation like this? How do we come up with an answer in which we can have moral certitude? Well, some people, a lot of people, a lot of traditionalists will say that we can't then it's just not possible. For example, Eric Sammons at Crisis Magazine, and I'm not picking on him, but what I'm about to read to you uh, is an opinion that's shared by a great many Catholics, from conservatives all the way up to the, the most vehement traditionalist. Writing on Twitter in response to someone else, and I don't know who, and I don't know exactly what he was responding to, but Sammons wrote, quote, I have no authority to declare that Francis is not the Pope. You don't have that authority either. 
And the few men who together might have that authority aren't declaring him an anti-pope. So unless they do, it's of no use to act like he's anything but the pope, end quote. Well, I have some really wonderful news for you. Simons is dead wrong. It most certainly is possible for us to get our hands around this nagging question about Francis. We can make sense of this situation. In fact, I'd say we have a duty to make sense of this situation. For ourselves, of course, but also for those around us. Every one of us has a certain circle of influence, even if it's just your buddies or your wife, your children, your co-workers, your neighbors. Everyone has a certain circle of influence. First and foremost, we're responsible for ourselves, but we also, according to that passage that I started this podcast with, St. Paul's letting us know we have an obligation to be instant with the truth in season and out of season, souls are at stake. It couldn't be more important. I I can't stress just how important it is to have a good understanding of whether or not the man claiming to be Pope truly is. As we continue in this conversation today, I think you're going to get a sense for just why it's so important. So how might we go about addressing the question of of Francis? And it's a question, again, that no serious Catholic is dismissing out of hand as being unreasonable. It's not. It's a universal question. It's a universal concern. And we saw it very early on in this so-called pontificate. People actually floating the idea, is the Pope Catholic? Well, I think it's a pretty important question if the Pope is Catholic or not, right? So one of the ways that people tend to want to address this question is by virtue of heresy. Right? What happens if the Pope falls into heresy? I have to say, I've approached the question of Francis along this avenue, and it's not the best way, in my opinion. It can be fruitful to have that conversation and to do that exploration, but it's a can of worms. It's a can of worms that leads to a lot of questions. Is he a material heretic? Is it formal? Uh, Is he pertinacious? Is the heresy notorious? And so on and so forth. And you're going to have a lot of arguments surrounding that particular question. And one of the reasons is because the church has never really formally pronounced on the matter of what happens if a pope falls into heresy. In fact, it's an open question as to whether or not it's even possible. St. Robert Bellarmine did not believe it to be possible. He commented on it as a theoretical proposition but he wasn't convinced that it was even possible that a Pope even personally could fall into heresy. Why? Because of the gifts that our Lord bestows upon the Holy Father. In any case, St. Robert Bellarmine is often quoted as saying that he endorsed the so-called fifth opinion. He went through five of them that were common in his day. And that's an opinion that states, quote, a manifest heretic ceases in himself to be Pope and head just as he ceases in himself to be a Christian and a member of the body of the church. Now, even though this is something of a can of worms, as I said, and it leads to arguments of all sorts, simply because the church has never formally pronounced on the matter itself, the good news is the church has most certainly pronounced in a most unmistakable way on the second half of what St. Robert Bellarmine said. Just as he ceases in himself to be a Christian and a member of the body of the church. And so this leads me to the second way in which one might attempt to get their hands around the question of Francis and others. And that's uh, relative to the question of membership in the mystical body of Christ. And this is perhaps, I think, the simplest way to address the Bergoglio problem. There are four aspects to membership in the church, we might say. Okay, baptism, of course, is the sacrament of initiation. It's how we enter the mystical body of Christ. Beyond that, membership requires the profession of the same faith, the true faith, partaking of the same sacraments, and submission to the legitimate authority, or put another way, the observance of the same laws. Now, once one enters the mystical body of Christ by way of baptism, these other requirements that I just mentioned reflect the threefold unity of the church, the unity of faith, the unity of charity or communion, and the unity of governance. Of course, that means submission to the Holy Roman Pontiff. Now, it's very important to recognize that membership in the church is visible. It's knowable, just as the church herself is visible and knowable. 
St. Robert Bellarmine, in his work De Ecclesia Militante, described the members of the church as, quote, an assembly of men as visible and palpable as the assemblage of the Roman people, or the Kingdom of France, or the Republic of Venice, end quote. Now, he's making a point here. He's not speaking with some sort of theological precision, but he's, you get to what he's saying. You know, you go to France and you can see there's, there's Frenchmen everywhere. They're visible. You know them. You have a small conversation with them and it's clear. This guy's a Frenchman or a French woman. You know, same with the Roman people and those from Venice, Italy. Pope Pius XII, writing in 1943 in the encyclical Mystici Corporis, the mystical body of Christ, he once again connected the visible nature of the church with the visible nature of membership in the church. He wrote, quote, Now, since its founder willed this social body of Christ to be visible, the cooperation of all its members must also be externally manifest through their profession of the same faith and their sharing in the same sacred rites through the participation in the same sacrifice and the practical observance of the same laws. Once again, we see that threefold unity touched upon, and it has to be manifest. Unity of faith, unity of communion or charity, and unity of governance. Elsewhere in this same encyclical, the Holy Father reiterated that it's necessary for the members of the church to profess the true faith. He's repeating himself, right? He, he says this in two different places. So obviously, he felt even in 1943 that it was very important to get that point across, that manifesting externally and professing the true faith is a requirement of membership in the church. He who does not do that is not a member. And it's on this requirement that we're going to focus in turning our attention towards this question about Francis. And the question is simply this, reworded. Does Jorge Bergoglio externally manifest the true faith? Does he profess the true faith? Or does he profess and manifest a false faith? One that's foreign to and opposed to the Holy Catholic faith. Look, I don't think there's a person watching this episode right now who would say, oh, yes, he professes the true faith. He manifests the true faith. Oh, no, no, no. He, do he doesn't oppose the true faith. He doesn't profess a faith that is far into the Catholic faith. No, no one would say that. And you know, speaking more broadly, I don't think there's a single serious Catholic, one that has a, a certain decent formation in the faith, who would look at a person like Francis take off the white cassock, okay? Call him John Doe and place before that person a dossier with all of Francis's public words and deeds, even those that are recorded in the Acta Apostolica Sedis, the Acts of the Holy See. And let them look at this case study without knowing John Doe's actual identity. And then at the end of that review, ask the question, is that person a Catholic? And the answer you're going to get, the only answer that you could possibly get from anyone who is actually serious about their Catholic faith and has a certain uh, decent, I mean, just a moderately decent formation in the faith, the answer is going to be no, absolutely not. That guy's not Catholic. And furthermore, that person may not even qualify as a heretic. He's probably more akin to a heathen. Okay, but then reveal his name and dress him up in a white cassock. And all of a sudden, people start to lose their mind. And they feel as though they can't say out loud, that man's not Catholic. He's not a member of the church. But he's not. Not because Louis Verecchio says so, but because Holy Mother Church has always taught very clearly what the requirements of membership in the mystical body of Christ are. And Bergoglio doesn't qualify. He does not qualify. It's not up to me to tinker with and 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 twist the requirements for membership in the church? How dare I do that? How dare you do that? If you look at Bergoglio and you have to massage the requirements of membership in the church so he fits, you're obviously on the wrong path. What we need to do in all things is to take what Holy Mother Church has always taught and apply it to the situation at hand. That's how you shine the light of truth on a confusing situation. If we shine the light of this truth on Jorge Bergoglio, the man is not a member of the church. Okay, so I think that is the simplest way to come to the conclusion he can't be the Pope. 
You cannot be the head of a body of which you are not a member at all. And I, I've said this and written it many different times, and I'm not going to stop until, you know, if God forbid I'm proven otherwise, I'll circle back and apologize and clean up my act. I've done that many more times than most anybody I know of in Catholic media. I'm not afraid to say I was wrong when I was wrong and give the reasons and move forward in the truth. But the fact of the matter is, folk, this isn't even a, a, a difficult question. It's really a no-brainer. Jorge Bergoglio is not a member of the church. He's not. He doesn't qualify. And if he's not a member, he's not the Pope. Okay, so here's another way in which we might approach this question, and it's by way of the ecclesiology of the church. What has Holy Mother Church consistently taught about herself? And if we get our hands around that, is it going to tell us something about Jorge Bergoglio's claim to the papacy? And as you're going to discover in this case, it's going to tell us an awful lot about the men who preceded him. As many of you probably know, Archbishop Lefebvre at one point said, quote, this conciliar church, speaking of the church in Rome, the one that's been uh, in occupation of the Vatican since the early 1960s, he said, this conciliar church is a schismatic church because it breaks with the Catholic church of all time. It has its new dogmas, its new priesthood, its new institutions, its new liturgy, already condemned by the church in many official and definitive documents. Elsewhere, the archbishop states very plainly, quote, this conciliar church is therefore not Catholic. Let that sink in. The conciliar church in Rome, the one currently in occupation of the Vatican, the one that's been in occupation of the Vatican at least since the time of Paul VI, is therefore not Catholic. Now, how can Archbishop Lefebvre say this? He can say this because in the church's traditional ecclesiology, it's often been said by numerous popes and theologians and catechisms that the church is infallible. The church is infallible. What does that mean? Don't let that word infallible fool you. It's not to say that the church has the authority to issue infallible definitions. She does have that, but when we say the church is infallible, we're not speaking exclusively of that authority that she has to teach infallible definitions. What we're really saying is that the church cannot err in the teaching of faith and morals. This is repeated over and over and over throughout the centuries by the church in various different forms, in the catechisms and in the teachings of the popes and the saints. The Council of Trent, for example, the uh, Catechism of the Council of Trent, also known as the Roman Catechism, which was actually written for parish priests to help guide them in the way of teaching their parishioners, the souls under their care. It states, this catechism states, quote, This Spirit, the Holy Spirit, first imparted to the apostles, has by the infinite goodness of God always continued in the church. And just as this one church cannot err in faith or morals, since it is guided by the Holy Ghost, and then it goes on to talk about the false churches that are guided by the spirit of the devil that teach false doctrines. The key here, folks, is that the church cannot err in faith or morals. Now, you'll notice there's nothing conditional about that statement whatsoever. The Roman Catechism doesn't say, however... The church can err in faith and morals if she's not issuing dogmatic definitions that are of themselves infallible, infallible proclamations. I know it gets a little confusing. We're going to clear it up moving forward. But you'll find that same kind of language in multiple catechisms, the catechisms, Catechism of Pope Pius X and numerous others, and I've cited them on the AKA Catholic blog if you want to take a look into it. The Holy Roman Pontiffs have always taught the same, and I'm just going to give you two recent examples of many that I could give you. For instance, Pope Pius XI, writing in Quas Primas in 1925 on the Feast of Christ the King, he says in this encyclical, and the manner in which he says it to me is noteworthy, it's almost matter-of-factly. He just kind of matter-of-factly utters this statement of Catholic truth based on the traditional ecclesiology that's so well-known that he says this with no fanfare at all. It's, it's almost as if he's saying it in a tone as if 
you know, look, everybody knows this, but he's just going to say it again anyway. The church is endowed with perfect and perpetual immunity from error and heresy. Another thing that I love about this citation, he says that the church is perpetually immune and perfectly so, not just from heresy, properly so called, the obstinate doubt or denial of a truth that must be held with divine and Catholic faith. That's a canon law definition of heresy, a narrow definition of heresy. No, that's not the only thing that the church is immune from. She's immune from teaching error, just plain error. She can't do it. She's perpetually endowed with this immunity from error and heresy. Pope Pius XII, the Mystici Corpus, once again, he said, quote, Jesus Christ, hanging on the cross, opened up to his church the fountain of those divine gifts which prevent her from ever teaching false doctrine, end quote. Ever teaching false doctrine. It means she never does that. She never does. And that should resonate in your Catholic heart. I mean, look, we, everybody who's truly Catholic, sincere and serious about their faith, Practice, practicing it to the best of their ability. We have a Catholic sense. We call our church a Holy Mother for a reason. She doesn't teach us false doctrines. Why? Because they would lead us to hell. The purpose for which our Lord established a church is to be able to speak in his name and to teach us the true doctrines that we need to know and to live in order to stay on the sure path to salvation. Right? We know this. Well, Holy Mother Church does not teach false doctrines ever. Pius Twelfth is not saying anything groundbreaking here. It's the, the divine gifts that come from Christ that prevent the church from ever teaching false doctrines. This is what Holy Mother Church has always taught about herself. Always. And God forbid any one of us feel tempted to tinker with this ecclesiology to allow for the church to occasionally teach us something that we need to reject in order to protect ourselves. That's just not a Catholic thought at all. So at this, I want to address the common and noteworthy concern that I've often encountered, an objection that's come to me by way of different priests even. And that is to say, look, theologians all agree that a non-infallible teaching of the church can include an error. Now, we have to be clear about this. There is truth to that statement. But this does not mean, and it has never meant to any theologian prior to the council, that the church, if she's not teaching infallibly, an infallible definition, it's all bets are off. Anything can happen. She might even teach you something that actually diametrically opposes something that she's always taught, right? She might be attacking something that the church has held to be true for many centuries. It's not that way. That's not what is meant. You see, it's one thing to say that a teaching might include a certain error in the way in which it is presented, but it's another thing to declare that the, the doctrine itself may be erroneous, and it might even be heretical, and therefore it may even be gravely dangerous to the faithful. The church has never taught that that's a possibility. In fact, as the citations that I've just read to you make perfectly plain, it's always been the teaching of the church that that can never happen. So what is possible with regard to non-infallible teachings and the presence of error? As I've already said, and I, it bears repeating, it is never possible that it might pose a danger to the soul, ever. An infallible definition, okay, the infallible dogmas of the church, the way in which they are presented and formulated is irreformable, okay? Okay. I want to quote to you something from the eminent moral theologian Benedictus Merkelbach, who was a emmanuelist who wrote prior to the council. And he said, you could find an error included in the way an uninfallible teaching is presented. Per accidens, something that needs to be reformed. Now, what does that mean, per accidens? It means an, something accidental or something incidental to the doctrine itself. It could be something that pertains to a matter of historical nature, where maybe something changed and the application changed and something needs to be reformed in order to, to clarify. But the doctrine itself can never be a danger to souls. Merkelbach also says that even that situation is extremely rare. It's extremely rare. And he doesn't even give any examples. I think he's just 
writing about the possibility that this could happen. And it's in a very rare occasion that it may happen that per accidens, there could be something attached to that doctrine that needs to be reformed. Per accidens is the opposite in a sense of per se, in and of itself. So the doctrine in and of itself cannot be erroneous, but the way in which it is presented might per accidens have an accidental or incidental portion to it that needs to be cleaned up. Now, it's for this reason that Cardinal Johann Franzelin, who was one of the most highly esteemed theologians of his time, the late 19th century, he could say with respect to authoritatively taught non-infallible doctrines, quote, in declarations of this sort, although there be not an infallible truth of doctrine, Yet there is an infallible security insofar as it is safe for all to embrace it. Make sure that resonates with you. Get it into your mind what he's saying here. If it's not infallible, and everybody understands that the doctrine's not being taught infallibly, there still is an infallible security. That means that it's perfectly safe for us to embrace and to live that doctrine. Contrast this with the conciliar church in Rome today, with the council itself. It's a factory of dangerous doctrines, false doctrines that do lead one off the short path to salvation. Pretty much every serious Catholic. If, I mean, and I'm talking about, you know, the staunch conservative Novus Ordo Catholics even, all the way through the most vocal so-called traditionalists. We all recognize that the conciliar church in Rome is a factory of, of false errors, right? The council itself has errors in it with respect to religious liberty, with respect to the non-Catholic religions, with respect to the heretic communities being used as means of salvation. So all of this being said, the conciliar church simply cannot be the Holy Roman Catholic Church. It can't, because the Catholic Church is guided by the Holy Ghost, in such a way that she's prevented, quote, from ever teaching false doctrine, according to Pius XII. So those churches, including the conciliar church, that do teach false doctrines, that do endanger the soul, that cannot be safely embraced by all, or by any, for that matter, clearly that's not the Catholic church. Even though it's claiming to be that, the, the conciliar church is a counterfeit. It is not the true church. Now, I know that sounds like an outrageous statement, but know this. This isn't a new idea. This isn't a, an idea that was spun up out of nowhere just to try to come up with a creative answer to the crisis that's, it's, that's at hand. No, this is something that for many centuries has been prophesied by many saints, blessed theologians. And Catherine Emmerich, Padre Pio, Father Sylvester Berry, one of the most cited of the preconciliar theologians. He wrote a treatise on the apocalypse saying that Satan is going to create a false church. It's going to confuse many. Even Bishop Fulton Sheen, before he lost his mind to the Second Vatican Council, he said that there's going to come a time when Satan is going to create a false church, one that will be the ape of the Catholic church. It'll be mocking the church. It'll present itself as the Catholic church, but it's not going to be that. And I'm telling you folks, it's here now. It's here now. I'm not necessarily, I can't say it's here in its ultimate form, but I can tell you that that conciliar church is most certainly a counterfeit. It's not the Catholic church. It can't be. It teaches error. It teaches doctrines that force us to, to weigh it and consider, is this something I can allow my children to believe? Is it something that I can embrace? That's not the Catholic church. Our Holy Mother, she never dispenses doctrinal poison, ever. So what does this say about the men who are in this case, Francis, and who have been the visible heads of this conciliar counterfeit church. The one of it, which Archbishop Lefebvre very plainly said is not the Catholic church, and he was correct on that. Well, I think it's entirely obvious. The men who were heads of this conciliar church that is not the Catholic church, they could not possibly also have been heads of the Holy Roman Catholic Church. They couldn't have been popes. Now, getting back to myself, you know, where do I stand? I think it's very clear where I stand with regard to Francis. He's not a member of the church because he doesn't qualify for membership. John the 23rd, I got to say, I'm not entirely sure. And to be quite honest with you, <clears throat> I'm not overly concerned about figuring it out in his case. 
<laughs> you know, I, I don't feel like that's all that super important. You pick up with Paul the sixth, the one who promulgated all 16 of the conciliar documents, all of those errors and dangerous teachings. He owns them. He sat atop of this conciliar church. So did John Paul the second, John Paul the first, of course, for 33 days, Benedict the 16th, Francis, all of these men who acted as heads of the conciliar church, how could they possibly be popes of the Holy Roman Catholic Church at one and the same time? They couldn't. They couldn't. It, it's, you know, the principle of non-contradiction is at play here. They can't be both. They're one or the other. Clearly, they were heads of the conciliar church. Now, I have to say, just to tell the complete story here with regard to Archbishop Lefebvre, in his attempt to make sense of the situation in his day, and let's cut him just a little bit of slack because he was very close to the fire. You and I have the perspective of decades that he did not have. But in trying to get his hands around what was going on, I'm going to pick up the quote with uh, where we left off. He said at one point, this conciliar church is therefore not Catholic. In the measure in which the Pope, the bishops, priests, and faithful adhere to this new church, they separate themselves from the Catholic church, end quote. Now, again, I, I'm not bashing the archbishop. He was very close to the terrible event, Vatican Council II. Heads were spinning <laughs> back in those days when he was speaking. He was trying to make sense of things, but what he's saying here is actually not sense, it's nonsense. The fact of the matter is, this sounds an awful lot like partial communion. You imagine someone walking a line and if he steps into the conciliar church, he separated himself from the Catholic Church, but then he happens to wander over onto the other side of the line, and now he's Catholic. He's not Catholic, he is Catholic. He's, no, you're either Catholic or you're not. Archbishop Lefebvre is talking about membership, essentially. Monsignor Joseph Fenton, who was one of the more celebrated of the American theologians, writing in 1961 in the American Ecclesiastical Review, he addresses this situation in a sense. He writes, it is not possible to be partially or incompletely or virtually a part of a society. He's talking about the church. One is either a part or not a part, a member or not a member. If he possesses some of the requisites of membership, but not all of them, then a man is not a member and should not be designated as such. Okay? So the traditional ecclesiology is perfectly plain. Paul VI on forward, the, these men were heads of a false church. They can't possibly have also been heads of the Holy Roman Catholic Church. They could not oscillate between one or the other at any given moment based on what they were adhering to. Okay, just to put it in a, a more uh, contemporary context, if I were to say to you that the head of the Russian Orthodox Church, which is a schismatic heretical church, that he could also at one and the same time be the head of the Holy Roman Catholic Church. You would laugh me out of the room, and you should. It's just preposterous to think that that's even remotely possible. It's not. So I think that's another very, it's, you know, it takes a little bit more effort. This is a very reliable way of trying to get your hands around the question as to whether or not Paul VI on forward to Francis are true popes. They can't possibly be because they were the heads of the conciliar church who labored mightily to spread the conciliar false religion throughout the world. Okay. So that, that to me gives me moral certitude that these men could not possibly be popes. There's one more way of addressing this that also is very simple. It does require you to roll up your sleeves and get to work on learning what the church has always taught in the centuries leading up to the second Vatican council but it's worth every minute that you might spend on that endeavor, and that is to get your hands around what the church has always taught concerning the papacy, the papacy and the supernatural gifts that our Lord bestows upon the popes for our benefit, allowing them to teach us and to defend the faith and to guide us along the way of salvation, to serve as our rule of faith. What does that mean to say the Pope is the rule of faith? He's the rule insofar as we measure our faith against what he teaches and preaches as he defends the faith and explains it to us, serving as our father, our teacher, and our guide on the way of salvation. Does anybody listening to this presentation now truly treat Francis as their rule of faith? 
Do you look to him to make sure that what you believe is good and true and fruitful and faithful? Absolutely not. It's the other way around. We take the proclamations coming out of his mouth and we apply it to what we understand to be true about the faith as if we are his rule of faith. Ultimately, we become our own rule of faith. That's not the church that our Lord gave us. Now, when we're talking about this idea of the papacy and what the church has always taught about the papacy and our obligations toward the man who serves as the, the Pope at any given time, over at the Novus Ordo Watch blog, Mario Dirksen, who runs that blog, has done a wonderful job of taking some of the, the teachings of the church as given to us throughout the centuries leading up to Vatican Council II, and he's encouraged people to engage in a very simple exercise that I think many people would probably be unwilling to engage in because they know what the punchline is, but to take those teachings about the papacy and the Pope and everywhere it talks about the Holy Roman Pontiff, the Holy Father, the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, plug in Pope Francis and see if he fits. You'll be laughing in hysterics or crying real tears <laughs> by doing that exercise. That man clearly does not fit into what the church has always taught about the Pope. And not just re with respect to who the Pope is in his own person and, and how he uh, acts as Pope, but insofar as how we are supposed to treat him. Remember what Eric Sammons said. And again, I'm not picking on Eric, but the things that he says in his tweet that I read to you are, is very much indicative of an opinion held by pretty much every person in Catholic media. So I'm speaking very much to my, um, I don't, I wouldn't call them my confreres, but you know, my, my, my friends and colleagues, if you will, in Catholic media, you know, I'm speaking to you. You don't treat Francis as the Pope. Anyways, Sammons says, after he says he has no authority to declare whether Francis is Pope and, and all that stuff, he says it's no use to act like he's anything but the Pope. Well, I would tell Eric, if you were sitting here right now, you don't act like he's the Pope. You don't. Absolutely not. You can say you're in communion with the guy, but you're not. You don't act like it. it you're acting like a man is the Pope. In other words, treating him as if he is the Pope, looking at him as if he is the Pope, being a communing with him as if he is the Pope, which is your duty if he is the Pope. It looks very different than the landscape of people in Catholic media today. Salmons, I don't think, I don't know if we would call him a traditionalist. I don't know if he calls himself that, but you go through, you know, all of Catholic media, your Taylor Marshalls, the Catholic Family News Gang, which are guys that I really like. Michael Matt and his crowd at the Remnant. It's almost difficult to listen to them rant about the Pope and think for a minute that, guys, you obviously don't really believe he's the Pope. Either that or you're entirely ambivalent toward your duty towards a true Pope. Look, Vatican Council I stated that, quote, the Church of Christ becomes one flock under one supreme shepherd by unity with the Roman pontiff, in communion and in profession of the same faith. Okay, the unity of the church, it's, it's one of her principal characteristics is unity. She's one, one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Does anyone in traditional Catholic media, do they really profess the same faith as Francis? Does anyone watching this today who considers themselves a traditional Catholic really profess the same faith as Francis? Does your conservative Novus Ordo friends, do they profess that faith? Do the priests in these Novus Ordo parishes, many of them, won't even say his name out loud? Do they profess the same faith as Francis? No, they don't treat him like the Pope. Salmon says it's no use to act like he's anything but the Pope, but guess what? You are. You are. You're just afraid to say that he's not the Pope. You don't understand that it's not about authority. When you look at someone like Jorge Bergoglio, you don't need to possess uh, the authority of ministry in order to say that man's not a Catholic. We know who one another are. The members of the church are visible. We are known to one another. You remember what Bellarmine said, that it's palpable. Membership is palpable. That means it's obvious. It's knowable. 
it's obvious to us that Francis isn't a, a Catholic. So it, it's not enough just to say, I'm in communion with Francis. Those words are absolutely hollow unless we really do act like he's the Pope. And as Vatican I makes plain, that means being taught and guided by him in the way of salvation. And why? Well, because that's what the Lord wills for the faithful of his church to do. That's what he wills for the members of his mystical body to do, is to look to his vicar as their father and teacher and guide. Vatican I went on to say about the Pope, this gift of truth and never failing faith was divinely conferred on Peter and his successors in this see so that they might discharge their exalted office for the salvation of all. And so that the whole flock of Christ might be kept away by them from the poisonous food of error and be nourished with the sustenance of heavenly doctrine, end quote. Does that sound like uh, Jorge Bergoglio to you? Does he protect you and others from the poisonous food of error, or does he dispense it? He doesn't have the gift of truth and never failing faith. It was not definitely conferred upon him and his successors. Let me be very clear. When Vatican Council I says that this gift of truth and never failing faith has been given to the Pope so they might discharge their exalted office. Might does not mean maybe they will, maybe they won't. That's not what it means. It means so that they may, to enable them to discharge their exalted office. Why? To enable them to keep us away from the poisonous food of error to enable them to nourish us with the sustenance of heavenly doctrine. Francis, he doesn't do that. And you could say the same even about Benedict, who had some of the trappings of tradition. He was, you know, his sheep's clothing was a little more convincing. But if you delve into his so-called magisterium, there's all sorts of poison there. Look at his relationship with the Jews. Look at the way he spoke of religious liberty. He was not protecting us from the poisonous food of error by a long shot. Look at what he said about the traditional Roman rite. It's an extraordinary uh, expression of the same Roman rite as the Novus Ordo. Utter nonsense. The damage done by Samorum Pontificum, despite any of the gifts that it delivered along the way, is, is stunning, very dangerous. It, it wounded many souls in the process. Pope Pius XII further explained the reason and the necessity of unity with the Pope, stating, quote, It is he, our Lord, who enriches pastors and teachers, and above all, his vicar on earth, with the supernatural gifts of knowledge, understanding, and wisdom, so they may loyally preserve the treasury of faith, defend it vigorously, and explain it, and confirm it with reverence and devotion. He's writing here in Mystici Corporis once again. Think about what he's saying here. These gifts of knowledge, understanding, and wisdom given to the popes, they're not natural gifts. They're supernatural gifts that allow the pope to defend the treasury of faith and to explain it. Explaining it, it means his, his contemporary preaching that explains it to us in the here and now so we can apply the truths of the faith in the way in which we live our lives today. It's not just an historical record. He's not just, the pope isn't here just to read from a book of doctrines. No, he's to vigorously defend the faith against attack. It's always going to be under attack until the end of time. We know that. But the Pope is here to teach in his ordinary magisterium what the truths of the faith are relative to the circumstances that are taking place in the world at the very moment. He's to explain it and to confirm it with reverence and devotion. Does that sound like Francis to you? Of course not. So there's another way in which to get your hands around whether Francis or any of his predecessors were true popes. Delve very deeply into what the church has always taught about the papacy, and you're going to see that shoe does not fit these men at all. It does not. You cannot force it on there. Now, I'm talking about, you know, men like Eric Sammons and my colleagues in traditional Catholic media, including people that I genuinely like and and enjoy their company and conversation with them. They don't treat Francis as if he's the Pope. They don't act like he's the Pope. They say he is. They say they're in communion with him, but they're not. Pope Leo XIII wrote, it is to give proof of submission to the Pope, which is far from sincere, to set up some kind of opposition between one pontiff and another. Those who, faced with two differing directives, reject the present one to hold on to the past, they are not giving proof of obedience to the authority, which has the right 
and the duty to guide them. And in some ways, they resemble those who, on receiving a condemnation, would wish to appeal to a future council or to a pope as better informed. This again is Pope Leo XIII. He's writing an, an apostolic letter called Epistola Tua. Okay? Think about this. He described to a T precisely the situation at hand today. Look at what happened when Amoris Laetitia came out. The very first reaction on the part of many conservative and so-called traditionalist media members and, and people who comment in social media. They, oh, we're not going to accept what Amoris Laetitia says. We're going to accept what Familiaris Consortio says of John Paul II and what Benedict XVI said. We're going to reject the present teaching and cling to the one of the past. We're going to set up an opposition between one Holy Roman Pontiff and another. That's the exact opposite of communion with the Pope. Okay? So, look, if you're treating Francis the way that Pope Leo XIII said is evidence that your submission to the Pope is not sincere, you should probably take a step back and reevaluate where you stand. And I am not, to be perfectly clear, I'm not encouraging you to submit to Francis. That would be like encouraging you to leave the church, walk out the back door and never come back. Okay. The point is the man's not the Pope. You have enough census Catholicus that you know it and you're acting as if he's not the Pope. And there's a reason for that folks. Anyway, so all of that, I hope that uh, long winded explanation as to how we might go about getting our hands around this question about Francis, is he truly the Pope? And then maybe applying that same criteria to the men who preceded him. I hope you found that useful. Put it to use. I'm not one of these guys that's going to sit here and insist that you think what I think and hold what I hold. Now, we're all trying to make sense of this situation, but I am here to tell you that Holy Mother Church, in all of the things that she taught very clearly, in the centuries leading up to Vatican Council II, she's given us everything we need to have moral certainty on the status of the man currently claiming to be Pope Francis. She's given everything that we need in order to have moral certainty about his immediate predecessors post Vatican II. Uh, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a matter of accepting what the church has taught and applying it without conditions and twisting it and contorting it to fit, apply it, to the current situation and these present questions, and the answers are right there for you. So at this point, I want to go back to my conversation with this nice priest that I told you I spoke with last week, and the conversation that we were having about, you know, when is it perhaps prudent and appropriate for him and others like him, other priests like him, who have decided that Francis isn't Pope, to go public with that information. And my answer to him, my first response was, I think there's a far better question than when is it appropriate to go public with that information. I think that question is why. Why go public with that information? And the, the answer to that question, why, is very important and it's very easily answered. And it's, we've been fleshing it out and everything I've said up to this point without, you know, actually saying it. The answer is right there. The reason is, if we continue to allow people to treat Francis as Pope. What we're doing is we're training people to distrust the Pope, to not have trust in the papacy as their rule of faith, to not look upon the Holy Roman Pontiff as their father, their teacher, and their guide. In other words, to view the papacy through Protestant eyes, all right, and to lose our Catholic sense for what the Pope is and the great gift that the papacy is to the Catholic Church. You know, we don't think an awful lot or enough about what it means when our Lord said, Lo, I am with you always, even to the close of the age. What does that mean? How is he with us always? Well, a Protestant would say, well, two or three are gathered in his name. He's with us. Oh, he's with us by virtue of baptism. We're configured to him in the waters of baptism. Okay, fine, but there's more to it than that, right? A Catholic might pipe up and say, aha, but the Eucharist, the Blessed Sacrament, he's really, truly, and substantially present in the Blessed Sacrament. He's present in the priesthood. He's present in the other sacraments. And I would say to you, one of the places that we've kind of failed to, to look at the presence of Christ that he promised would be there 
for us until the end of time, is in the person of the Holy Roman Pontiff. He is profoundly present in the Pope. That's why we call him his vicar. He speaks for Christ the King. He reigns on his behalf. That's how he can serve his father and teacher and guide. And to make sure that he can do that effectively, our Lord has bestowed supernatural gifts on him. Okay? So the, the question, why go public with that information? And I'm not speaking you know, directly to priests because I feel as a matter of, of respect in a sense and recognition of the fact that they are in a position that I'm not in. You know, I can speak more clearly and confidently to people who are in Catholic media, because I'm living that life. For our priests, what's prudent for them may not be prudent for me. What's prudent for me may not be prudent for them. Okay, so I'm speaking primarily to that group. But it applies to priests and bishops as well. You know, our Lord will judge if, in fact, you're being prudent or being cowardly. That's not my call to make. And it's not even my call to make with um, my uh, colleagues in Catholic media. But I'm just saying I'm more confident directing my, <laughs> my words towards them. And here's the thing. Look, if you have a certain degree of moral certainty in your heart that Francis isn't the Pope, isn't a member of the church, he isn't the head of the true church, not going public with it, you're training up a new generation of Protestants who their outlook is one of distrust of the church and of the Pope. That's Protestantism. I recently wrote an article in AKA Catholic on this topic. It's called Timeline 2035. How will a holy Pope be received? And if you think about it, the way in which traditionalist and conservative Catholic writers and commentators are treating the question of Francis they're essentially guaranteeing that their audience, if they really take up the same attitude, when a Holy Pope does come on the scene and Holy Mother Church does come out of the shadow that's been cast upon her by this false conciliar counterfeit church, and she begins teaching clearly once again, these same people are going to apply that criteria to a good and holy Pope, and it's going to be disastrous. They're not going to know how to teach to treat him as their father, teacher, and guide, and their churches, and the church's holy mother. And that's the tragedy of it all. And I dare say that anyone who really contemplates where they're leading souls by failing to share publicly and openly and explaining the reason why they have moral certitude that Francis is an anti-pope, the consequences of keeping that truth to yourself are grave. Their grave. And so this brings me right back to where we began at the very start of this podcast. As St. Paul said in his second epistle to Timothy, Jesus Christ is going to judge us based on whether we were instant when we were faced with people adhering to false doctrines, seeking out fables, and uh, turning away from the true doctrine. Did we teach the truth when it was out of season? Did we willingly pay the price for doing that? And I have to tell you, look, I, I, there's a lot of reasons why I'm not looking forward to facing the just judge on my particular judgment. But one of the things I'm not fearing is keeping truth to myself. I, I, I don't do that. And by God's grace, I will never do that. It's kind of my pledge to you as my audience. If I have moral certitude that something is true, I'm going to share it with you and tell you why I think it's true. And if I come upon something later on, which I probably will moving down the road and have to circle back and say, hey, I didn't get this right and here's why. I'm going to do it. I don't care what it costs me. Even if these podcasts end up going out to 12 of you instead of 1,200, I don't care. So I would just encourage everybody who has whatever your circle of influence is, even if it's just within your own household, delve into this question. It could not possibly be more important. And look, I appreciate you putting up with me for this, this long episode. Look forward to seeing you back here again soon. I'm Louis Barakia. Yeah.